cooperating with us for many years. It was always a pleasure. This is the fifth of a series of psychological intervention after disaster workshops for the Asia Pacific region. The aim of this workshop is to bring together with renowned international specialists in various fields of disaster related basic and applied research. Your participation are essential. And I wish a great success of this workshop and hope you will enjoy the fifth PIAD in the beautiful city, Manila, this time. Thank you. So with that, um, thank you. I wish I could invite you to the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy. It's a bit uh, far from where we are today, but if you do get the chance, uh, please come and visit uh, this time after the conference or maybe in your next visit to the Philippines. This is a report on a workshop in Manila, the Philippines, and unfortunately, in contrast to all other workshops, I was not able to attend this time. I will be substituted by a dear colleague. IUPSIS represents more than a million psychologists around the world. It is the worldwide membership organization for all the psychological societies around the world, 90 country members and 20 affiliate organizations. And if you go onto the IUPSIS website, you can see the previous workshops. You can see, if you don't know them already, other participants from your country who've been at previous workshops. It is uh, a very important workshop for us and we would like uh, for the region to be uh, much stronger in future in terms of uh, the knowledge, the know-how and the science of uh, disaster. The Philippines uh, is a very disaster-prone country. As uh, can be seen from the list of participants, we have the largest number of participants to this workshop uh, is actually from the Philippines. In the Asia-Pacific region, 4 billion people live. This is 60% of the entire population of the world, and they suffer from 41% of all disasters in the world. This is a tremendous figure given the fact that there are entire regions of the world rarely hampered by disasters. So it is a concentration of disasters. And uh, this workshop was, again, especially uh, on methodology, on resilience, on intervention, on prevention, also on support for the development of educational training uh, at universities. And also, uh, we wanted to uh, encourage people to form social networks. The faculty always represent a mix of different disciplines. So uh, we have, this time we have a cognitive neuroscientist, cross-cultural psychiatrist, a methodologist, and I'm a, a developmental uh, prevention researcher. This was the fifth workshop in Asia Pacific. Oh, every year once a workshop. And with basically no overlap in participants, a little overlap in the faculty. This means that in that field, there is already development taking place, and the field is relatively broad. And we always wanted to have excellent people from excellent universities that have an experience in dealing with a diverse public. Joop de Jong from the Netherlands, he is a major figure in public health and a psychiatrist by training and the co-inventor of cultural psychiatry. I'm going to talk about public health and public mental health, which increasingly in the world of psychology, social science, is the paradigm. ISTSS team this year is all about public health and public mental health. Now here you see Latin America, a few hundred million people each week in this part of Africa, they go in trolls in Pentecostalist churches. All over the world, you see hundreds of thousands of expressions of distress or trauma, which is not PTSD, which may be a pettiness of fear, you, like you had a assault hysteria in China, hundreds of thousands of Chinese, they wanted to buy salt, because they thought so protects against the, the Japanese Fukushima disaster. 
and they ran into shops and they wanted salt to, pr to, to protect the, the thyroid growth. So you see this phenomenon all over the world. Dissociation, trolls, mass possession. You remember the old coral epidemies in, in Malaysia, in, 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 in Indonesia, where men thought that the testicles, the penis would withdraw and then they would die. So we have many, many of these collective phenomena of the world which have nothing to do with PTSD. Yeah, I have a question about the public mental health. Do we, we need a new system for the public mental health? Or we should combine the mental health service in the current public health system? Uh, your question is whether mental health should be part of the public health system? Yes, yes. Um, yes. I think so. And the public health system is very wide because the public health system is the health sector, is the educational sector. So when you want to work with children and adolescents, you often work through schools. You work through school psychology. Uh, so I think we should be integrated in the overall public health structure, especially when it comes to disasters or conflicts. Klaus Bönke from the Jakobs University in Bremen in Germany. He is a cross-cultural psychologist and a social methodology uh, specialist. And his basic message is that scientifically dealing with um, disasters is equivalent to a quasi-experiment. What I'm about to present to you uh, is about research and how to conduct uh, as I see it, good research about long-term consequences of disasters. This is what happened with the worries. The macro worries in 85 were higher than the micro worries. All the worries dropped to wave seven in 2006. They were 14 on average here, so they were um, 35 at this age. Both things dropped. Now remember what I wanted to show. Namely, among those who had a high appraisal of the danger of nuclear war, and who then participated in political activities, peace movement demonstrations, that they would be better off 21 years later. How, how to handle this zero? Because uh, because of that zero, many differences happen statistically. I don't see this danger so strongly. I typically work with, I give my lowest, my lowest score in a Likert scale. I give it the score zero. I think it's, you can transform it easily as long as your, your, your numbers are equally distanced, it's not a problem. I, I don't see a big problem there. Of course, in, in statistical analyses, if you then have divisions and things like that, this, of course, is, causes problems, but you can easily then add one. Yeah, yeah. That, that is what I was saying. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Abby Gewürz is a professor at the University of Minnesota. She specialized in prevention and intervention on the family level. So we had the public health and we had the individual and now comes the intermediate, the family level. And she has um, developed interventions against all kinds of disasters and trauma that hits families. And today I'll tell you a little bit about what the field of prevention research is, because it's a relatively new field. So we were very pleased with the program's effect on parenting, but we were also a little bit uh, concerned because most of the fathers in our uh, sample were soldiers, and we did not have a main effect on fathers parenting. We only had an effect on high-risk fathers parenting. So we wanted to find out a little bit more about why that is. And, um, 
what we found was really interesting was that we had, like I said, for the, um, for the high-risk fathers at baseline, there was a program effect on improving observed parenting. Um, not a main effect of the program, but a, what we call a moderation effect. But we also had an effect of the program on improving fathers' mindfulness at one year. So that the fathers who went through the program who were high risk didn't just improve their parenting, they also improved their mindfulness. Now, why is this important for fathers? And this, what, the reason I give you this slide is because I want to show you that it's, there are so many things that are important to understand. In this case, we're talking about gender effects, fathers versus mothers. So for mothers, you recall that it was parenting and for couples that you improve parenting and parenting leads to improved or is associated with improvements in child adjustment. How did you pick up appropriate yoga activities and how did you train the children? Uh, I, why I'm asking this is because I am also planning to develop an intervention module for children with cancer and I wanted to incorporate yoga into it but I am confronted with this problem. So I just want to know how did you overcome this issue? So why did we use yoga? And we didn't use it very much, just in a small way. So re recall that what we presumed or hypothesized were that parents, we would see higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, so problems in emotion regulation. So we wanted to strengthen parents' emotion regulation. If I were to show you the clip, you would see, this is a really, it was a really fun clip I had to show you that. What happens with parents who aren't emotionally regulated or have problems with that is it's very hard for them to say discipline their child. Because when the child, when there's a, there's a problem, the parent shouts, the child shouts, and that's not what we want to teach. So you train, people, you train parents in mindfulness, meditation, and yoga as a way of improving emotion regulation, and particularly for parents who have PTSD, it grounds them. For some people, they can do a sitting meditation, and for others, that's very difficult, and movement like yoga is really helpful. Professor Gan from uh, China is a curious combination of the one hand a neuroscientist, and on the other hand, a quite traditional clinical psychologist. She utilized the concept from Frankel uh, many decades ago. It was originally developed, namely meaning making. And I will focus on three, um, two points. Uh, one is. Uh, in every uh, empirical study, I will stress its practical implications because uh, a lot of you are doing some uh, clinical work. And the second, I'm, I'm trying to present some methodology that uh, I think a lot of methodology can be used in the trauma research as I presented. And, uh, so, um, we think that Finding meaning in adversity and trauma is an important aspect of resilience. And also a rich body of research on resilience have not integrated the meaning making. So um, our task is to combine the resilience and meaning making and we should find what types of people benefit more from the meaning making efforts in terms of its resilience. So what is your guess? I think maybe some of you may have the same guess as my uh, previous uh, hypothesis before doing this experiment. And I found that uh, I thought, I predict that high resilient people will be better at making sense of uh, a negative events. Uh, how did you measure the uh, rumination and the future orientation? Are you planning for your future? Are you, uh, are you always has the habit of getting ready to do the important things? Such things like that. Is Professor Murataki Sugiura from Japan. His university actually is located in a region you all know. This is the Fukushima. He is also a neuroscientist. And what he wanted to learn is become very concrete in showing that individuals differ in their reaction to the same event as an, uh, depending on a number of factors. The topic of today is power to live. First, I will explain what is power to live. 
what is it and how was it built. And then I go to a cognitive science approach to this topic. And uh, we uh, uh, investigated the correlation between this factor score and the behavior or experience in the disaster. Yeah, for example, F2 that, I, that we labeled uh, now was associated with the successful uh, refugee-related problem solving. The pe people who have high F2 score solved more problems in the refugee setting. Yeah, it's quite, uh, quite un understandable. Uh, there, are, of, of course, there are other uh, associations, and these data in the, uh, in the uh, sheets that I uh, distributed uh, today. Did you, did you consider um, including the level of intelligence as a covariate, something that you need to control over? Because the tasks would involve some level, I mean, would require yeah, yeah, it, it's a good point. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, and we d we don't have um, IQ data for the four uh, uh, one thousand four hundred people. Uh, but uh, uh, we have some data on the uh, length of the education. Maybe we can we can include that. We also had uh, Professor Hesanova from the Philippines as an invited uh, guest speaker, and she shed light on all the issues. Uh, we mentioned there resistance, resilience, recovery, and then brought in South Asia perspectives, meaning the particular culture and cultural mix, so religious I that mix. I, what I could share with you today is a perspective, um, a cultural perspective, a developing country perspective. Um, and this talk is coming from both literature as well as our own experiences in trying to develop interventions and trying to assess whether or not they work. Okay. What there is affirms uh, the impact that has been found in other parts of the world. Although I found it interesting that in literature from Southeast Asia, there's a lot about spiritual, the impact, the spiritual impact of disasters, as well as um, the feeling of loss and safety, because there's a lot of displacement that is happening. Okay, so when you talk about why, why there's a lot more vulnerability in, in Asia, obviously poverty is um, the main concern. However, there's also the issue of governance and corruption. And we know that, that funds, donations get channeled to other purposes and don't really reach the intended beneficiaries. There's also the issue of perspectives on aid. And here, I use the helicopter <laughs> cartoon to describe how our dilemma after Haryan and after many disasters, when we would have people coming in and say, this is what I want to do. And I remember uh, one of our dilemmas in PAP at that point was there was this person who wanted to train uh, to do grief counseling. Do you think your, uh, your lip state effect is the same as the Western, uh, those in the Western studies? You know, in JAP, uh, they published a uh, famous article that in uh, the Western countries during uh, economic depression, people are more likely to use, uh, not people, females are more likely to use lipstick to attract the partners. So is it the same rationale or are you doing it according to that kind of theory? I think that's their basis. The, the administrators who decided that was their basis for giving lipstick. Um, and not to say that it was not appreciated by anyone, okay? There probably were people who appreciated Does it work? lipstick. Did you, uh, did yeah. you evaluate? The no, they didn't. They, didn't. No. Okay. they just gave it out. And of course, what we heard were the grumblings of the teachers who laughed at receiving lipstick when they needed roofs, you know. <laughs> what they did, they said, we needed a roof, and we got lipstick. How do we get it into an active learning situation? First, after each of the faculty presentations, there is a discussion. And at the end of the discussion, the uh, faculty prov uh, provides a number of questions that illuminate core issues of the talk. Then people break up into groups, discuss it, and come back to the auditorium 
present what they found and get feedback first from the um, faculty and then from everybody else in the room. What are the gaps? No? Uh, what are the existing gaps? Uh, given this context and given this current program, what do we now want to uh, include in an expanded form of the program? Another this core element is related to the posters of people's own research. In part, it is empirical research already conducted. In part, it's plans. In part, it is reports on a practical means, say, in an institution dealing with um, disasters. This is an experience a doctor student of mine would have once a week for at least an hour. And a dissertation fellowship takes three years. This is 150 such opportunities. They got one. Uh, uh, culturally appropriate guidelines, since Indonesia doesn't have uh, any guidelines on how IDP management is. You mentioned okay. there were words like there was fights, you know, and the integration yes. efforts, mm -hmm. uh, it, they didn't work out. So <laughs> were there words between the IDP people in the camps and like the original community, you know? Were the tensions between like the original inhabitants and the people who were then relocated? Oh no, there are mm. there has there are there were no conflicts because they are they were evacuated to a new place uh, because it was once uh, they don't, it's a new place it was a forest so they cut them down to make it a relocation oh, for people. Yeah. Uh, By going out of this comfort zone, um, this workshop gave me the, the opportunity to think out of the box and probably explore other uh, uh, ventures wherein I can improve my practice, also my research skills, and it gave me uh, the direction to somehow uh, uh, focus on what I am really passionate about and that really is helping people who are been devastated by, by disasters. We have to have these kind of regional workshops. So I think it's quite unique in the, in the science community. And of course it's a little bit of drops in the ocean, but many little drops still make a little lake. And what we see over the past five years, the couple of times that I have been here, is that there is an increase in quality of the participants and there is also certainly uh, an increase in quality of research that they're doing. But I, my takeaway from the workshop is that in as much as we allow science to guide us, our action should always be guided by compassion and respect for the context and realities of the survivors. Thank you. Well, I found the, uh, the advertisement, the announcement accidentally on the internet. Hmm. I'm a member of uh, LinkedIn, so I saw it there. I want to learn more about how to help the disaster survivor because there's a lot of disaster happening in my country. Um, as you know, um, Mount Sinapu has been erupting and I've helped a um, few months ago and I really, really want to learn how to help them better through this workshop. And then also what I find uh, impressive is that it's not a one-time event, of course, if there's a disaster then also psychologists might jump in, but that this is the fifth and there's going to be a sixth um, event I heard next year. Uh, this uh, shows that uh, there is a, um, well, there is a clear intention among psychologists, among the international union that um, you have to be aboard when when the real world problems are are uh, there and uh, what I like particularly is that um, uh, tough real world problems and uh, academic uh, expertise, research expertise are brought together. Mm. It's just I guess everybody was kind of friendly and warm so it was really nice but now uh, that the conference I think turned out even better than I expected. I mean it is very interesting ideas were presented. Even I learned a lot from this particular experience. So it, it's been great. And, but, but in terms of the work, maybe I'm a little glad it's, it's finished. <laughs> uh, I hear some, some from some of the, the participants, however, that they're a little sad 
that it's over because, you know, I guess I made some friends, which is good, which is good. Because I see one issue, and the issue is that we have basically exhausted the potential of interested and interesting people. And I personally would like to suggest that we should also go to other regions of the world, like, for instance, Latin America. But this is things to come and to think about. I'm actually very excited to uh, share my experience and all the things that I have learned from this workshop to my students. And I agree with Nancy when she said um, that in the end, it's about the people that we're trying to serve. So um, I'm actually very inspired right now and motivated to like do more applied research. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you.